Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. I appreciate you tuning in today. I'm recording this episode in early April 2020, which is the middle of the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. This pandemic has resulted in some orders restricting non-essential travel. All the schools are closed for the rest of the year. The college class I teach has gone all online, and almost everybody's working from home. So in the midst of the turmoil, and since we're in the high holy days of Texas history, I thought I'd do a series of episodes related to the historic sites of the Texas Revolution. So this is the first in a series I'm going to call Exploring the Texas Revolution. There'll be five of these episodes, and in these episodes I'm going to interview some Texas Historic Commission personnel in charge of some of the sacred places where events of the Texas Revolution occurred. We'll discuss the role that that particular place played in the revolution and what you can see when you visit those places. Now, since we're in the middle of this pandemic, uh, the places that have parks associated with them are still open in a limited capacity, uh, but some of the visitor centers are closed. However, when this mess is over, you'll know why these sites are important and you'll be able to plan your visit to explore the places where the Texas Revolution occurred. I want to tell you one thing up front about this series. I am leaving out the Alamo. The Alamo is so iconic, so special, and so complex that it's going to get episodes all its own that I plan on recording from the Alamo, and that'll come a little later. But most Texas Revolution activity actually took place in other places, and some of these places you'll recognize, and a couple of them don't immediately come to mind. But all of them are interesting, and all of them are important. So let's explore the Texas Revolution and get wise about Texas. The first site we're going to is the capital of Austin's colony, San Felipe de Austin. Stephen F. Austin founded the town in 1824, and he founded it on the banks of the Brazos River, where the El Camino Real, the road from the King's Highway from Nacogdoches to Bejar, where it crossed the Brazos, And the town, for obvious reasons, was the economic, political, and social center of Austin's colony. Everybody came to San Felipe. In this episode, I sit down and visit with Texas Historic Commission site manager Brian McCauley about San Felipe and how you can come and enjoy the capital of Austin's colony. So let's go to San Felipe with Texas Historic Commission site manager Brian McCauley. Brian, thanks for joining Wise About Texas today. Absolutely. Thrilled to be with you, Ken. Well, please introduce yourself to the listeners. Tell us your title with the Historical Commission and what you do. Sure. I'm Brian McCauley. I'm the site manager of the San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site, which is also the home of our newest visitor center project, which opened in 2018. I also am the distance manager of the Fannin Battleground Site. So I work with a couple of the Texas Revolution sites for the agency. And I've been privileged. Uh, I, came to, I came to work for the agency right after the initial site transfer in 2008. So I've been on this project here at San Felipe for over a decade. Well, what's a day in the life like here at such a historic site? Sure. So we are thrilled to serve all of the typical audiences that you would imagine. You know, in school year, we're doing field trips and bringing school kids out, hopefully to hit some curriculum touch points related to Stephen F. Austin's colony and the settlement of Mexican Texas. We also work with any number of stakeholder groups Uh, that are coming out for the same sort of experience as adults. Um, So that's a big part of it. Um, I'll be blunt in saying this is a story that most Texans don't really know very well yet. We're still working on that. And so we're not getting the volume of tourism traffic you might expect for a site like ours. That's going to take a little while to build as people become more aware of our connection to stories like the Alamo and San Jacinto and the like. I think you'll see the tourism traffic pick up and that'll be a fun part for us to have a higher number of station wagons with people that are coming from farther flung places. Uh, I joke with my Texas Revolution colleagues, I am the best located of the Texas Revolution sites (laughs) in terms of on and off the interstate, uh, right on the main travel corridor of Texas here off of I-10. So uh, those people are coming, but right now we're mostly serving more traditional stakeholders. Well, I want to get into why this site is so important in the history of Texas, but before we do that, Let's describe it a little bit. Well, I should say for our listeners, we are recording this right in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic of 2020. 
So certain sites are closed, but certain historic sites are open. So you mentioned we have a visitor center here and a, a, some park area. Is any of it open right now? So the grounds currently are still open to visitation, um, and we have a unique situation in the way this site has evolved. Um, the main roadway, the throughway in the little town of San Felipe, San Philip as it's called locally, um, divides our site into two portions. And the older section, which has been the commemorative site since the 1920s, is on the west side of the road, and the new facility is on the east side of the road. So for visitors that might be coming out during the current uh, public health crisis, the west side is accessible right now. So you could pull up and park and walk the grounds and get a little green space, obviously maintaining all the, the guidelines that people are asking you to in terms of social distancing and that sort of thing. The uh, facilities that we're in, the visitor center and all, are closed to the public until we get through this craziness. Right. And. Uh so talk about the west side. The visitor center is here on, on the east side. What's on the west side that's been there since the 20s? Sure. So this site um, was well known to local history stakeholders. Every small town's got their invested group of history people. And in our case, there were several, but uh, most prominently, a man named George Hill, who was involved in some of the state's early efforts to commemorate and preserve parts of Texas history. But he had roots here with his family in the little town of San Felipe. He and many others got excited in the 1920s about the prospect of identifying the site. And what they got right, there's a public well that was built in Stephen F. Austin's lifetime that's over on the west side of the property. And they knew that that had to be a center to the downtown business district, which it was. And so early on, there were efforts to build a replica log cabin to help commemorate the story. But going back to the 1920s, we have an obelisk piece that was installed, literally uh, fundraising done by school children pulling nickels and dimes together. And then for the centennial, Mr. Hill led the charge to make sure that the centennial statue of Stephen F. Austin commissioned uh, in the 1930s came to this location. There was some early discussion of it being staged in Brazoria County where Austin had died and where his sister's family lived. And so the, the political campaign here in support of local history got that redirected so that it came to us and is sitting across on the west side. So we think of the west side today as a commemorative zone. That's where the earliest efforts to denote the site and remember it were. It also is a significant footprint of the archeological zone. So one of the unique facets of our story is that the town was destroyed during the runaway scrape. And so we use archeology span as a way to, to look at uh, information about the town's past. There's also on the west side an historic building, which is one of the oldest buildings in the, in the town built around the end of statehood, uh, somewhere around uh, 1845, 47, 48, somewhere in there. And we used it as a visitor center while we were building the new facilities here. It also has history as a museum. And one of the things I'll talk briefly with you today about is a desk that's in our collection that that museum opening in the early 60s was the reason that Stephen F. Austin's desk was able to come home to the town. So that's been a great boon for us. Um, people enjoy going on the west side. We have some interpretive panels over there. A lot of times when we're doing active archaeology, it's on that side and we want people to stay engaged with it. The addition of the new visitor center has really compelled most of our traffic to come here. This is where people are centering their experience. And we're excited about that, but we'll spend the next few years giving them reasons to get out into the landscape and, and enjoy more of the site. So the public well is on the west side and, and we can think of that maybe uh, or have in the past at least as the center of town. It is. Center of the old town. And when we talk about San Felipe during this interview, we're probably talking about 1836 San Felipe because San Felipe, Texas still exists. It's Correct. much bigger than, than it was in 1836. But um, all right, so you mentioned the revolution and that's, uh, we're, in the, we're in the revolution time and that's why we're talking about uh, these historic sites. What, if you, there's no way to do it in a nutshell, but give me your impression of San Felipe de Austin's connection to the Texas Revolution. What was going on here? Sure. One of the fabulous things about opening a property like this, where I know, I certainly didn't get these stories in school or, or being a history nerd, find them myself. So being able to bring even Texans who think they know a lot about Texas history here to have an experience that may surprise them, that's a wonderful outcome. Our visitors really enjoy learning about things that they didn't know or they weren't clear on from the past. So the most important connection that I share with people about our revolution story is that after the come and take it incident at Gonzales, you have two very unique things happening. Which happen. was October 1835. October, beginning of October 1835. Um, Stephen F. Austin 
takes to the field as a military officer in response to that, which is not the way Texans tend to think about Stephen F. Austin. He's a diplomat and a statesman, not a soldier. And honestly, he didn't seem to be a great soldier, so that may have been the way we should <laughs> think of him. But he takes to the field and commands an army that includes William Travis, Jim Bowie, James Fannin, kind of all the people we would think of with the exception of Sam Houston. And they lay siege to San Antonio in an effort to keep the Mexican army from coming in and disrupting some of the political upheaval that's going on here. So that's an exciting story for us to talk about. Austin is not at San Antonio long enough to be the successful general. He's recalled politically and sent to the United States on a mission, but uh, he's a big part of the early part of that chapter. And then the other thing that our visitors really have no concept of is that you have a government here that's formed in November of 1835 that is openly running a war with the Mexican national government, but they're not willing to do it in the name of independence. So they're fighting a revolution for what I would describe as regime change. They believe that Santa Ana has violated the tenets of their immigration and that they came here to be part of a republic in this new nation of Mexico, and Santa Ana has instead turned it into a tyrannical dictatorship. And so their response to that is to say, we are justified taking up arms and keeping Santa Ana's uh, dictatorial army out of Texas, and we're gonna fight them in that regard. Um, it would only take a few months for that to migrate to an outright independence declaration, but the story of San Felipe is a, a revolution being run for a different purpose than most Texans think about. And while Stephen F. Austin was um, over near Bejar, another important Texan was here at Correct. San Felipe. Tell us about that. So that's one of my favorite stories to, to flip on people when they come here. Um, using that idea of kind of pen and sword, we think of Stephen F. Austin with a pen in his hand doing these diplomatic statesman-like things and building a colony in Mexican Texas. And we tend to think of uh, the other big Texan, Sam Houston, as carrying a weapon and being a military leader. So in that moment in the fall of 1835, when Austin is on the battlefield, Houston has chosen to be a diplomat. And he's here helping form the government that will ultimately run the revolution that I mentioned. He actually uh, took command of the Texan army, which is essentially non-existent if you think about an enlisted army, which is what the government was discussing uh, while he was here as part of that government. But in our exhibit, we have an interactive in which we have Sam Houston introduce the concept of Mexican statehood for Texas, which is part of what's at the root of this political battle that ultimately leads to revolution and independence. And he himself had made the same proposal in 1833 that he had enjoyed the idea or supported the idea of Texas becoming an independent Mexican state. And he reintroduced it during the political discussions in the fall of 1835. So here you have the hero of San Jacinto, the, the, the winner of Texas's independence essentially, telling the politics, uh, the political leaders of the time that he supported separating Texas from Coahuila, but remaining part of Mexico. So all these things are moving very fast, politically and militarily. So basically you've got, as things are heating up, the two arguably certainly the best known Texas fathers, Stephen F. Austin and Sam Houston, both operating out of San Felipe uh, in a sense. But Stephen F. Austin was here first. This was his the capital of his colony. He chose the site, right? Correct. Yes, he did. Um, so what were the businesses that had sprung up before the revolution here? What was the town like? So as much as we enjoy talking about Stephen F. Austin and his efforts here, kind of from an intellectual venture perspective, that he's here imagining how he can empire build or build a town that's gonna to be this future prominent location. I always tell visitors one of the areas that Austin confused himself and, and made the wrong analysis was what was going to happen in this town that he's building. Because I think Austin believed the majority of his settlers from the United States and other parts of Europe and Canada were going to want to live in an urban setting. So he's imagining San Felipe as this place where everyone who comes from the United States to his colony is gonna have a home here, they're gonna have a business here, and he believes that because he thinks they need safety and security of numbers, and he thinks that's how they're gonna get the supply chain they need on the Texas wilderness, is having a city that's the central aspect of that. So he's surprised, initially, when most of his settlers say, we're just gonna live on the big piece of land. Give us the seven square miles, and if we never see you again, we'll be all right. <laughs> so it doesn't become a town full of colonists. It becomes a company town in the business of giving away free land. And so the people that occupy it are lawyers, translators, surveyors. There's a high per capita uh, lawyer representation in San Felipe for many reasons. Some would say that's unfortunate. That, well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting part of the story. Some of them are pretty prominent Texans like William Travis. Um, but we get some really interesting insights 
not just from how the town ultimately emerged, and it's a lot of single men, so there's a small service industry of taverns and, and uh, hotels that are trying to feed them and do those sorts of things, but it's very interesting to me that uh, people like Travis, these lawyers that are here, they come for the land process and the immigration process, but they end up being really integral to one of the fields that we use for research. We find a lot of stuff about the town through probate records. So it's a debt-driven economy. People are promising to pay for things that they can't pay for now. Um, sounds a little bit like today. even. Right. You know, like but they're making all these promises on paper. And inevitably, the vast majority of them never break even. Stephen, Stephen F. Austin himself never breaks even on paper. And so at the end of the day, the lawyers sweep in when someone passes away and makes these long lists of who owes what and who's owed from whom and tries to come up with some balance. And so we get a real sense of what was happening in the town oftentimes from the probate records that are left behind. What were some of the, who were, you mentioned William Barrett Travis, I'm gonna ask you about him because we found some things, or you found some things here related to him, you think. So what, who were some of the other prominent citizens? What businesses did they run? Because the urban center concept, I mean, it they did need a town, so they there did. was a town. So right. who? Who were the prominent citizens and what were they doing? And it became the second largest town by population to San Antonio in its brief life, so that's an interesting part of the chapter too. Um, in terms of people that lived here that Texans would know, um, potentially, Gail Borden, who would later become the milk magnet, um, he's here as a Stephen F. Austin supporter and loyalist. And uh, Robert Williamson, uh, Robert McAlpin Williamson, who's often referred to as Three-Legged Willie, if you've heard mm -hmm. those stories, the namesake of Williamson County. He's here in a prominent role. Um, interestingly, what I tend to tell visitors is it's less about the big names, although they're certainly here. And on the female side, you've got Jane Long spending a brief bit of her time in Texas, the, the mother of Texas. Um, what's more important, I think, about the prominence of San Felipe at this era is that I feel like I can connect almost anyone who came to Mexican Texas to some business here, whether it's, a, whether it's passing through and stopping by the land office, whether it's being here for some of the political efforts that are going on in the 1830s. So almost everyone, whether they're in Austin's colony or not, had business here. And Sam Houston's a good example of that. He never lived in Austin's colony, but he comes here frequently uh, on, a, on various different uh, initiatives. So that's a fun thing for us. The one prominent Texan or connected to our Texas history person that I often say I can't connect to San Felipe is David Crockett. I don't have any evidence that uh, in his migration from Tennessee, he was told to come to San Felipe, but most of us believe he stayed north on the King's Highway and went straight to San Antonio. But he would have come if he'd I, had if, more time. If he'd have lived longer, <laughs> if, if things had played out differently with the Alamo, he would have been here. There's, yes. there's no doubt about it. Of course, he would have only had a month before the town was gone, so that would have been the challenge. <laughs> That's true. Well, um, have you determined archaeologically the layout of the town and the location of various businesses, uh, how have you done that? So we have been very fortunate. Um, we've relied on some tremendous research by a partner scholar of ours who actually was a former boss of mine in the museum world named uh, Michael Moore, who for those of you that have met him in his past life, he was the director of the Fort Bend County Museum Association for 20 years. And Michael is just uh, an absolute sponge when it comes to the San Felipe story. And he's, he's got a 15 to 20 year head start on me and he's just a tremendous researcher. So he really goes deep. Um, that's helped us a lot. And so he often jokes that he's engaged in archival archeology span while we're doing in the ground archeology. span But we marry those two things together to try to get a sense of where the town was. So we have resources like the plat that Stephen F. Austin used to plan the town. And we have to navigate that carefully. If you look at this very ambitious thousand acre city on paper that Stephen F. Austin is imagining, if you just had that as a tool, you'd make some very clearly poor decisions in analyzing it. Because right down the middle of town, which marries up with the, the farm to market road that splits our site today, that would be the center of the town coming into the business district from the south. And in fact, in Austin's lifetime, that was the eastern edge of town. And we've been able to identify not much migrated. Essentially half of his paper town never existed to, to this east side where our museum sits today, or there was very little of that uh, in existence. So that's an important part of how we understand it. We have been able to go out using deed records, using who was on what lots in the town to inform some of our archeology. span And there are places where we have discovered, we think the remnants of particular buildings. Uh, one was a hotel building, uh, referred to as the Farmer's Hotel when it was originally constructed in 1830. And that was an interesting exploration because the building has a brick cellar. So that was a great target for us archeologically and we're, we're pretty confident we're, we're into that history uh, in the ground. 
we found evidence of where we believe William Travis's law office was, um, where we believe Stephen F. Austin's initial land office was. That building became a tavern in its own history, and Austin's land office moved out onto private property. But we've had some great opportunity to find some things. There are targets that we haven't found yet, and there's reason to believe we may not totally be able to as things play out. You can imagine in a town that was destroyed by fire, so spoiler alert there, the, the burning of the town is what took place during the runaway scrape. Um, our archeological targets tend to be things like where are we gonna find a brick fireplace associated with a building? Or where are we gonna find something that would survive the fire? In the case of that cellar, that was a great target and we're excited to have it to explore. Uh, but in some of these other cases, buildings are more fleeting and some of the objects that we find in the ground will help us understand what was there. So you mentioned Travis earlier. In the footprint of what we believe was the Travis Law Office at the time of the destruction of the town. Let me course, interrupt you for a sure. second. Give, give the listeners a little background of what Travis did here. Sure. So William Travis, who had been a bit of a, a political um, revolutionary after he arrived in Texas and had gotten in some trouble over on the other side of the, the Houston Ship Channel in the town of Anahuac, decided he was becoming a distraction with his kind of war support and his hot-headedness towards the Mexican government. And he migrated and brought his law office to San Felipe in the middle 1830s, about 1833, and immediately takes the position of being the town council's secretary. And so we get some unique insight into Travis because he's keeping the books for the government here, but he's also running a law practice. And so that's a unique opportunity for us to explore. One of the things that I find fascinating about Travis, and he's not alone in this, many of the more hot-headed war party type Texans that we think about going back to the early 1830s also supported Stephen F. Austin and looked to him for leadership. So we think of Austin as this diplomat and appeaser who was, who was not inclined to, to combat in war, and yet Travis and many other men are kind of waiting for him to help them determine how to act. So there's a, there's a great deal of respect amongst them all. But uh, Travis, in his capacity here as a lawyer, gets involved in a number of important cases uh, over time, not things that you would know without coming to visit the museum. Um, and he's involved in the development of the revolution government and immediately enlists. That's how he gets assigned to the Alamo ultimately and meets his fate uh, at that particular outpost. And he left from here, from San Felipe to go to the Alamo. And one of the first things he does once the siege begins is he writes his very famous victory or death letter on February 24th, which is sent right back to San Felipe where he knows the government that's running the revolution is operating. So Travis is a real fascinating figure for us. And I found it interesting when I took this job, I felt like the town had sort of avoided claiming Travis for fear that his story belonged to the Alamo. There was some hesitancy about making military history and Travis's story a big part of our operation. But it is, it's a really significant story for us. And what we think we know about Travis, he had a law office in at least two, if not three different locations over his brief time in the town where he was renting buildings essentially. But he also seemingly lived in those buildings. So he didn't own a home necessarily. He would stay in his office and, and live out of his office. And one of the explorations we did in terms of deed and probate records let us figure out who Travis's uh, landlord was at the time of the town's burning and that let us uh, with pretty good certainty land on where we think the law office was located and it happens to be here pretty close to the new museum facility. Um, we've done some archaeology there and we have a few things on display in the exhibit that we would say are associated with the footprint of that building. I can't absolutely tell you they belong to William Travis, but our interpretation would be these are things in his law office when the town was destroyed, which include a couple of beautiful bone-faced dominoes, one of which is decidedly burned, and then there was a men's wedding ring um, also found in that footprint, which is unusual. Uh, wedding rings are not a common archeological find. A lot of us tend to be buried with wedding rings, so they're not something you would necessarily lose or leave behind. But if you know Travis's story, and that he had left a wife in Alabama who found him just before the revolution got heated and insisted on a divorce, I can spin a pretty good yarn about why Travis might have had a wedding ring sitting on the shelf of his law office at the time that it was burned. Um, sadly, it's not engraved to my beloved William or anything else that lets us make that connection, but definitely found in the footprint of the building we think was the Travis law office. Well, that, that's a fascinating explanation of not only Travis's connection to this town, but and what he did, but also the archeological work that y'all are doing out here. Right. What, uh, tell us, and, and 
I won't keep you much longer, but tell us about the programming that y'all do out on this site. How are you interpreting it and promoting, promoting its history to the public? So I'm pleased to say that early on, as we were thinking about interpretive efforts here at the site, uh, many people who were part of the planning team for the San Felipe experience and what it would be to visitors in the future put public archaeology on a top three, top five uh, list of things that we should be pursuing. And one of the great outcomes of this project is we became the first of the state historic sites that had a staff archaeologist assigned here that works with us every day and helps us with stewardship and helps us think about where we can explore more of these research stories. So uh, Dr. Sarah Chesney is an important part of our staff and is a great uh, addition to our team from that perspective. I think you're going to see that happen more and more with sites that have prominent archaeology. But the idea of using archaeology as an interpretive tool I've always found to be really powerful. So I had the privilege, oh gosh, 20 years ago of touring uh, the Texas Independence Trail region with a team of state tourism professionals and they happened to include at the time the archaeologist who was running the LaBelle project and the Fort St. Louis project down on the Gulf Coast. And uh, that gentleman walked the grounds here with me at San Felipe and said, this is the next big public archaeology ground zero. So he had just finished what I would argue was the most famous archaeology project in Texas history and was telling me long before I ever imagined I would work here, this is the next one. This is the place where we're going to find great things. And so I always had that in the back of my mind. Um, what that will look like over time, I joke with people, we have a temporary exhibit gallery we use to bring in stories that we can migrate in and out of the building, and we have this fabulous archaeological resource, and if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, there's enough work to do in both of those arenas that I can make, I can make a list of things on paper that I'll never see in what remains of my state career. There'll still be things we're working on archaeologically, there'll still be things we're putting into that exhibit space that are my idea but that we're not going to get to because time is not going to allow us. There's just some really fabulous stories to explore. So what we hope will happen, we're working on an outdoor exhibit as we speak that we'll install sometime in 2021. We'll see what uh, the delay of uh, our public health crisis does to that schedule. But we will be opening up some outdoor buildings that are representative of the kinds of structures that were here in Stephen F. Austin's lifetime. So that'll be a new part of an outdoor exhibit that people can experience when they come visit in the future. And connected to that, some of those buildings represent structures that are part of our archaeological research. And so we'll be making those connections for visitors as well. And what we hope happens, let's just say the five-year window for the facilities here at San Felipe, are that you come and have a great experience in our visitor center and see our permanent exhibit and whatever fabulous uh, story we have in our temporary gallery, and that that motivates you to go out into the grounds where history actually occurred. And you spend some time here next to the building where there is a little bit of archaeological footprint, you go to our outdoor exhibit and see those buildings and understand what people were living in. And then hopefully about twice a year we're going to be doing active dig seasons. You might be here at a time in March or in October when you can go out and see our staff archaeologist and her crew looking for the next great stories of San Felipe or, or how we can tell the stories that we know better based on those archaeological resources. So I think it's going to be a really unique experience for visitors as we get it all put out here in the landscape. Well, I look forward to seeing that for sure. What um Finally, let me ask you this. For someone who wants, when, when we do reopen the Visitor Center, hopefully soon, what, uh, what's a perfect day at San Felipe? What do you recommend your average Texan to come out? How do they best learn? Sure, and I'm going to throw a little bone to some friends of ours who I hope survive all this craziness as well in a tough industry. Um, I would encourage people, if you're coming out uh, at a time when we're doing archaeology, let's just say, let's paint the best picture I can. So if you're coming out when we're digging, I would say get here mid-morning, come in between 9 and 10, plan for an hour in our exhibit space. Most of our visitors right now are spending about 60 minutes in the main exhibit. If you're a history nerd and are willing to go deep in some of the multimedia we use, you could spend a lot more time. So be forewarned if that person's in your party, figure out how y'all want to handle that. But uh, there's a fabulous little restaurant down the road from us called the Double E Grocery that has been a popular stop for our tourists. It's, it's the typical thing visitors ask for. Is there a non-chain restaurant that does some funky food and whatever? And so they're just a few miles from us. So if you came and did the museum, got a little look at the grounds, went and grabbed some lunch, came back early in the afternoon and went to the archaeological site to see what the crew is doing out there, had a chance to visit our outdoor exhibit space where we might have some living history or other types of demonstrations going on. I think you could, uh, you could do a good two to three hour investment in some core Texas history. And I would venture a guess that much of what you would hear from us 
are things that you're not familiar with, despite uh, your love of Texas history or never sleeping through a seventh grade history class back in the good old days. Uh, I think we've got some things you probably don't know very well, and I find that to be a very rewarding part of the visitor experience today. Well, Brian, thanks for joining us on Wise About Texas, and, and best wishes on this very, very important site in Texas history. Thanks so much. We're all thrilled as staff to be stewards on this project, and I think it's something we're all going to remember as a highlight of our careers, having a chance to, to put a museum like this in the landscape for a story that was not very well known as we got started, and, and hopefully it will be much better appreciated over time. Thanks for being with us today. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. Well, that's going to wrap up the first episode of The Wise About Texas Exploring the Texas Revolution series. I want to thank Texas Historic Commission Site Manager Brian McCauley for joining me for that great interview at San Felipe de Austin. We conducted it at San Felipe. And uh, you can get to San Felipe if you're coming from the east, you're going west on I-10 and north on Farm Road 1458, just outside of Sealy, Texas. The opposite, of course, if you're coming from the San Antonio area, east on I-10, the FM 1458 exit. Turn north and head to the Brazos River and you'll see the town of San Felipe de Austin, a place where so much important activity connected to the Texas Revolution took place. It's a great look into life in Austin's colony and life in early Texas. Be sure and stay tuned for the upcoming episodes in our series on exploring the Texas Revolution. And uh, no listeners, I have not forgotten part two of the episode on the Twin Sisters. If you're enjoying Wise About Texas, like us on, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Wise About Texas. Like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. And if you get a minute, leave a review on iTunes. That helps other people find the show. And I want to thank everybody that's done that. The reviews are positive, and I really, really appreciate it. That'll do it for this episode. Everybody stay safe. Go out and do something for Texas. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.